Okay, good day. My name is Tom Dresser, and I've written a book about ghosts of Martha's Vineyard, which may sound rather out of this world. But in this era of the pandemic, the economic recession, and the upcoming presidential election, we need some ghosts and some scary things that we can be entertained with and amused and enjoy rather than be frightened to death. So we're going to be walking through the Oak Grove Cemetery here in Oak Bluffs. And this film is being presented by the Oak Bluffs Library for your pleasure. And we'll have an opportunity to have questions or comments at the end of the program. We're going to go through about a dozen graves and talk a little bit about each of the people who are buried here. And then I have a little ghost story to add to each one of them. So we'll see what we can come up with. And we're glad you're along for the walk. So Ghosts of Martha's Vineyard is underway. We're starting here with the grave of Shubela Norton, who was one of the six men who put together the Oak Bluffs Land and Wharf Company back in 1866. Shubela gave to the company 75 acres of land and they built up a thousand house lots in the area next to the Martha's Vineyard campground. Norton was responsible for building the bathhouses that ran along Pay Beach, which were used by young and old throughout the era of the uh, Oak Bluffs Land and Wharf Company. It was a pretty impressive uh, operation that he had. He used salt water and heated it in big tubs with the sun and then people could take a shower with that too right next to the uh, bathhouses. So there's plenty of stories about Shubela Norton but now we're going to jump to a ghost story from the same era as this and that starts over in Edgartown at the Kelly House which is next to the or part of the news of from America which is a little pub that is definitely worth a visit and all through the Kelly house there are stories that the staff has shared over the years of specifically about the widow of a whaling captain her name is Helen and she's a ghost that has some stra rather strange experiences she has knocked glasses off the barroom shelf. She has knocked candlesticks off the mantel. And once she took a Christmas tree ornament and rolled it across the floor, and then it came back just like that. Helen was once seen standing by the fireplace in the news. And she's a wispy haired woman with a bluish dress and she sort of faded into the fireplace after she had shown herself. She's more active in the winter time when there's fewer people and one of the uh, waitresses there thinks that she's kind of lonely and likes to experience of sort of sidling up or coming close to people. So that's the story of Helen at the Kelly House. And we're going to move on from here, but we're going to leave Ghosts of Martha's Vineyard sitting right by this gravesite so that we know where we're located and what it's all about. So come on, follow me to our next grave, which is the oldest, one of the oldest ones here at Oak Grove Cemetery. And this is indeed the grave of Benjamin Claghorn. And Mr. Claghorn was a mariner who died on June 9th, 1759 in Vineyard Sound. And along with him was his 11 year old son, Samuel, and Samuel's cousin, also 11, named Barnabas. So the three of them were drowned in Vineyard Sound, and they were buried here among the first graves at Oak Grove Cemetery. Now a ghost story of this same era 
happened shortly after the experience of Mr. Claghorn drowning, and that's the story of Polly Daggert. Now, Polly was one of the three Liberty Pole girls who, in 1778, were in Vineyard Haven when the British ship Unicorn came in to the harbor and demanded that they take over the Liberty Pole, which is a great big, tall, towering flagpole type uh, structure in Vineyard Haven. And the three Liberty Pole people blew it up. They didn't want to have the British take it. So they blew up the Liberty Pole and the Unicorn had to go away without getting an, a repaired uh, mast. Now Polly Daggert had a little bit of uh, psychic powers in her. Uh, one time her father was coming home late for dinner. He was a sailor and his wife was upset that he wasn't home for dinner. And Polly said to his, her mother, put the food on, dad's gonna be on his way. He's coming around West Chop right now. Everybody looked out, there was no sign of him. And two minutes later, his ship sailed around West Chop and he made it home for dinner. Now that's a good part of being a psychic. The bad part of being a psychic is that you can see something that you don't really want to see. And one time Polly Daggett saw her brother Silas and he was injured. His forehead was all bloody and bruised and she was upset about it. And days later she came across the body of her brother who had drowned and his body was washed up on the shore and that was a very sad scene. So that's the story of Polly Daggett, one of the uh, Liberty Pole girls and this is the, one of the oldest graves in Oak Grove Cemetery. So we're going into now to walk over to one of the more recent graves which is a lot more current and a little bit strange in its own way. And we're going to take a seat at a bench here. It was put for just this purpose. And this is the grave of Tom Clancy, the very well-known, prolific uh, writer. He wrote Patriot Games, he wrote The Hunt for Red October, and he was just a very uh, prolific uh, storyteller. And unfortunately, he passed away uh, seven years ago and is buried here. Uh, Mr. Clancy had a little bit of character to him and a bit of anger, one might say, because he had an experience where uh, one Thanksgiving they hired a rent a chef to cook Thanksgiving dinner. And just before the dinner, Mrs. Clancy realized that the cook had not put sauerkraut on the menu. And Tom Clancy always had to have sauerkraut. And what was the cook to do? Well, she didn't know anybody on the vineyard other than the Clancy family, and of course the cab driver who had dropped her off at the Clancy homestead. Well, she called the cab driver and somehow he managed to get sauerkraut on Thanksgiving and deliver it to the Clancy home. And peace was maintained. So this is the grave of Tom Clancy. And now a story that uh, relates a little bit in an indirect way. And that's talking about the Martha's Vineyard Museum, which is now relocated to uh, Vineyard Haven from Edgartown. And that's a, a prominent resource for all sorts of historic documents and items from our past. But those of you who know the history of the building itself, that was the old Marine Hospital. And the Marine Hospital, built in 1895, housed a number of uh, patients who were injured or wounded at some sort of naval situation or something to do with the uh, on the water and 
There are stories that there were some rather unseemly characters who stayed there. And what we find a little bit interesting is that there are stories about the uh, people who were patients there, that their ghosts or their spirits are still housed in the museum building, that they're down in the basement along with old gurneys and old supplies and old repairs pieces of people's work. And that when the old hospital, before it became the museum, it was the St. Pierre uh, Summer School for Children, and kids would be playing there. And we have stories in the ghost book of several kids who played there and were absolutely terrified of the spirits that were said to be down in the basement of the old museum building. So we don't know how much of that is true. We never saw the spirits coming out and actually running around and frightening the kids, but it certainly makes a good story and makes us feel that Halloween is alive and well with spirits from our past. So we're going to move on from here now and walk over to a site that's the grave of one of the elder Oak Bluffs uh, residents and listen to his story. So we're coming to the grave of Albion Hart, who was a well-known campground uh, denizen, a, a gentleman who lived to uh, be over a hundred years old. It's Albion Hart in memory of Albion Clifford Hart. He was born in 1908 and he died in 2009, so he lived to be 101. And a couple of the stories that Albion Hart used to share were when he was just a, a teenager, he was aware, he lived over on Uncas Avenue, right off Circuit Avenue, and there was a major gas explosion there. And everything blew up around where he was because somebody forgot to turn a valve of the gas that ran into the Martha's Vineyard campground, the Methodist campground. And so that big explosion ended all gas service going into the campground. And Albion used to tell that story that dated back from his childhood. Another story he used to share was that he used to swim at Pay Beach and he used the bathhouses that Shubela Norton uh, constructed for the use of the people nearby. And he, Albin Hart, used to wear this woolen bathing suit. And the men in those days had a bathing suit that went down their legs and out the long arms, covered their arms and chest and everything. And it was made of wool. And after he'd been swimming, he would hang the bathing suit up in the uh, bathhouse and then the next day he would go back and put it on but the wool didn't dry that well and so the bathing suit was wet and cold and clammy and he'd have to put it on and it just wasn't as pleasant as one would like to think it was so this is the grave of Albion Hart and he he was known for running the um, the information booth at the base of Circuit Avenue for a number of years, telling his stories about the bathhouses and beyond. Now another story from the era of the campground is that a, a woman who was a, a, in college age was asked by her family to go down to the campground and open up the house for the season. And we'll call this uh, woman Susan. And Susan went down there, she brought a girlfriend so that she wouldn't be lonely and they could have a good time. And everything was set on opening the cottage and then the two girls went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, Susan heard and felt and saw a strange 
situation with a woman walking by her bed. She felt the rustle of the clothes. She saw the outline of the woman in the room. And at first she thought it was her girlfriend. But she looked over and the girlfriend was in bed, fast asleep. Susan was a little taken aback by this. But the older woman, the spirit of the older woman, or whoever it was, walked by Susan, didn't bother her, just walked to the end of the room, opened the door, and went up the stairs. And Susan was so calm about it, she just rolled over and went to sleep. But there was nobody else in the house the night before they went to bed, and there was nobody else in the house when they woke up in the morning. So Susan can't explain what happened, but years later, that experience is still right in her mind. So a campground ghost. Okay, we're going to walk around the cemetery a little bit more. We have three or four more stories to share with you. This is the grave of Louisa Izzet and Georgiana O'Brien. They were two sisters and they had a brother, Thomas O'Brien. And Louisa Izzet and Georgiana opened a little inn in 1899. It's still around today. It's the Tivoli Inn. It's right on Lower Circuit Avenue. And what was important about the uh, Tivoli Inn was that it was open to primarily to African Americans who weren't allowed or weren't invited or weren't able to use a hotel because of segregation in the early part of the 20th century. So the Tivoli Inn was open to those people who were denied access at other facilities and they were open to people who needed a low income place to stay. And Tivoli Inn is still around today, as I mentioned, and it sort of set the tone for the black uh, visitor, the black vacationer who wanted to come to Martha's Vineyard. So we're very proud of Louisa Izzet and Georgiana O'Brien. We want to talk about a hotel where people were staying. And this is much more current, and I want to make sure that you understand this is something that experienced, was experienced right on the island just recently, 20 years ago. And it's a story that happened in Edgartown and it's been repeated a couple of times by other people, other stories that are very similar to this. It happened at the, rest, at the hotel called the Victorian, which is now known as the Christopher on South Water Street. And what was interesting about this was there was a couple from the South that came here on their honeymoon in the year 2000, just around the 4th of July in 2000. And they stayed at the Victorian and they were very neat people, very conscious people, young and alert and focused. And every time that they went out of their room, whenever they came back, something was a little bit different. Something was a little strange. And they found it very unnerving. They complained to housekeeping, they complained to management, Nobody had an explanation for it. But here are some of the things that happened. They went out one day, it was a little bit cool, and they wanted to close up the, the room. So the windows were closed, the French doors were closed, they made sure their room was locked up. They had the towels on the, on the rack in the bathroom, they had the flower vase right where they knew where it was. When they came back, the French doors were left wide open. Now you, to open these, you would have to either be in the room pulling them out, or you would have to be outside opening them. 
So one way or the other, those doors opened by themselves. Another time they came back to their room, and as I said, they're very neat people. They would make their own bed in the hotel room. They came back, they looked in the bedroom, everything was fine. They looked in the bathroom, and the towels that they had hung neatly on the rack were on the floor, like somebody had taken them and flung them on the floor. They couldn't explain it. Another time they came back, and a vase which had been on one table had been moved down to the other end of the table. But the strangest thing that happened was that another time they came back in the room and the rug under their four-poster bed had been turned around to a different angle. Now to do that, you have to physically lift up the bed. All four posts have to be off the ground to swing the rug around. They couldn't explain it. It still sticks in their mind. Something or someone was playing with them in some strange way. So that's the story of the Victorian. And now we're going to walk all of five feet and come to the grave of Dorothy West. Probably the best known uh, grave in Oak Grove Cemetery. And what makes this stand out is Dorothy West. She was an only child. Her mother was one of 22 uh, siblings. And Dorothy was born and came down here uh, in the early part of the 20th century. She was a member of the Harlem Renaissance, which was an artistic group in New York in the 1920s. And Dorothy was a writer for that. Later, she worked for the WPA writing uh, pieces that in Roosevelt's administration for the New Deal. And she moved permanently to Oak Bluffs in 1948. She became the correspondent for the uh, Vineyard Gazette, writing about Oak Bluffs news. And she wrote a number of st short stories. And there's some great books at the Oak, Oak Bluffs Library about, uh, written by Dorothy West. What I found most intriguing was she wrote a novel in 1948, The Living is Easy, about her mother. And then a second novel in 1998, it was published called The Wedding. And when she was writing The Wedding, it was edited by someone from Doubleday Publishing that you may have heard of, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And Jackie Kennedy came down to uh, the Highlands and came to Dorothy West's house and the two of them uh, entered the house and they were going to go over the manuscript and Jackie looked around the room and there were piles of books on chairs and manuscripts on couches and more books over here and books there and she, Jackie said to Dorothy, where are we going to sit and work? And Dorothy said, right here. So the former first lady and Dorothy West sat on the carpet in Dorothy West's little house in the Highlands. Very neat little story about Dorothy. Now, as a correspondent for the Gazette, we have another story. Um, this one is about a, a woman named Elsie Fenner, and she lived in Chilmark. During World War I, she was a nurse. During World War II, she made bandages with other women in uh, Vineyard Haven. They made them upstairs at Brinkman's and sent them. the bandages went overseas to, for the soldiers there. And Elsie Fenner was a rather uh, prominent woman in the Chilmark business world. She ran the Wayside Farm, which was a bed and breakfast in the 1950s and she had a number of guests come there and comment on what a nice place it was and as I mentioned she was a correspondent for the Vineyard Gazette and she kept the news of Chilmark current in people's minds. Now uh, 
Elsie Fenner died in 1967, but she didn't disappear. And she was seen and heard for a number of years by guests who came to the Wayside Farm. They could see the woman at the end of a hallway on the second floor of the house, a wispy type woman, long blue dress, old style of clothing, never saying anything and just sort of fading away. And then other times guests at the house would hear her typing away, typing away at those columns for the Vineyard Gazette. And yet Elsie Fenner was no longer with us. So maybe her spirit really wanted to stay with writing for the Vineyard Gazette. We're going to take a little walk from there, right around a corner here, and come and see a grave of someone who's still alive, still with us. There are a number of people buried here, but we're talking here about Bob Penny. He was born in 1923, and he's still alive, and moving in on 98 and going strong. We hear he's got a girlfriend and enjoying himself. I talked to Bob a few years ago, and one of the things he said was that he was a uh, the first employee of De Rosa's, that the original Tony De Rosa hired Bob Penny way back when, when they were getting started. So that's something to be proud of. During World War II, the Penny family owned a little diner on Circuit Avenue, and Bob told me that sugar rationing was a big deal during the, uh, the war, and still the family made sure that each table at the little diner had a bowl of sugar for those who had to add it to their coffee or whatever. And everything was going well until this woman came along and took the whole bowl of sugar and dumped it in her purse. She'd rather have a whole messy purse that was sweet than go without sugar. After that, the pennies had to throw the sugar bowls to, away and just deal without. So Bob Penny. Also his family owned and ran the Pequot, but that was I think before he was born. Now another story that's a little bit strange to, to share is something that uh, I, just, I just feel the person who told me believes absolutely what she told me. And that's what I have to say about virtually everybody who spoke with me believed what they told me, absolutely. So this is the story of Humphreys, which has been a, a restaurant and a, um, a bakery for 70 something years. And they currently have a sandwich shop at the uh, Woodland uh, Strip Mall in Vineyard Haven, which some people can go to. But years ago, their headquarters were at the old house near the uh, intersection of State Road and North Road in West Tisbury. And the old Humphrey house is set back a little bit. You can see it. It's no longer in the Humphrey family, but the stories still live on. And what's interesting about it is that there was a rocking chair in the house, and the rocking chair would rock even when nobody was in it and that made it a very strange situation. So people would come up to the front door, they'd look in to see if anybody was home. Nobody was there, but the chair would go back and forth. And people talked about that, and it was just something that stayed with the Humphrey family. Now another element that I think is even more fantastic and almost more believable is that uh, Donna Humphrey, who works at the Humphreys in Vineyard Haven, told me that she, when she was a little girl, she visited, stayed with her grandmother at the family homestead. And her grandmother was working at the kitchen counter 
and Donna was just sort of behind her, but they weren't both looking at the same thing. And Donna turned and saw Dan Baxter there. Now Dan Baxter was the family um, butler and he was very well dressed. He usually wore a top hat, tuxedo tails, the whole thing. And Donna saw him holding a tray right there. And it just seemed a little strange because she hadn't seen him before. And she turned back to her grandmother and she said, who is that man? And her grandmother turned around and there was no Dan Baxter there. Now Donna tells that story as if it happened yesterday. And it was, what, 40 years ago at least. And it stays with her because it was so real. And later on when Donna was no longer a little girl, she was talking with some of her cousins and told them that story about Dan Baxter and they all took it in stride. They said, oh yeah, we've seen Dan Baxter. We know he's still around. And he died years and years ago. Believe it or not, as Robert Ripperly would say, we don't know how much to believe and how much to not believe. So we're here with Samuel Mingo's grave and he did die, 1935. He was a member of the Wampanoag tribe. He lived in Christiantown, but then he married a woman from Oak Bluffs, and so he moved here and was buried here. And Samuel Mingo was a whaling man. He went out into the Arctic. He was very prominent in his field. He never made it to captain because there was prejudice against Native Americans and blacks but he did um, get a reputation as a very uh, reputable and experienced and knowledgeable whaling man. He was a mate on many of the whaling expeditions, especially those that went into the Arctic late in the whaling era around 1900. So this is the grave of Samuel Mingo, and we're going to move now to a legend that has been passed on by the legendary ancestor of the Wampanoag tribe, and that's a story about Moship and the building of the bridge to Cuttyhunk. And there are two versions of the story, and the first version is that the devil made a bet with Moship that he couldn't build a bridge across from Gay Head to Cuttyhunk and Moship thought he could. He started to work and he found that he put his foot in the water and his big toe was bitten by a crab. And that was the end of it. Moship never built the bridge and the devil won the bet. Now the second story, which is a little bit more amusing and intriguing, is that the bet was made that he couldn't build the bridge before dawn, which meant that Moship had to work all night. Now, as this legendary Superman, if you will, um, Moship was stronger and bigger and better than everyone in the, on the island, everyone in the world, a super character. And Moship set to work and he got these great big stones and he put them down in the water and he was working diligently away and he thought he could get a bridge going all the way across the Cuddy Hunk overnight. But this devil had something else in mind and he enticed a woman to bring a rooster to the uh, area where Moship was working and the woman held a candle up to the rooster. The rooster saw the candle thought the sun was rising and started to crow. And that gave the devil the upper hand. It meant that Moship had not been able to finish the bridge before the sun rose or before dawn or before the rooster crowed. And so Moship lost the bet. And all we have left of 
the bridge that Moshe tried to do are a few uh, glacial erratics, a few big stones that are in the shoreline off of Gay Head. So that's the story of Moshe and the story of Gay Head and the story of the legends that are told through the years about what happened in our native land. Now, in conclusion, I just want to mention that I spoke to a couple of people who have done quite a bit of uh, thinking and experiencing what uh, spirits and ghosts are all about. And one of them is uh, Karen, who lives in Vineyard Haven, and she feels that the ghost is someone who had an incomplete life. There was something that they were uh, doing and they didn't get it done. So they come back and they're still working on it. She feels that they're not sure whether they're alive or dead. They're sort of living in that nether world between. And then there's Victoria who works in Egertown and she has a similar sense of ghosts, but she feels that there's an energy that they left where they died. And it's some sort of force or power that some people can recognize and it almost comes alive or comes back, but then it fades away. She compares it to a fingerprint. You can't really see a fingerprint, but if you put powder on it or something, it can come alive. Well, she feels that a person who dies leaves some energy in the place where they died, and that's a spirit that can come back. She compares it to a negative of a uh, photograph. So whether it's spiritual, whether it's energy, whether it's real, or whether it's something that we imagine or let ourselves go. That's what ghosts are all about. We don't have a hard and fast answer, but we do have a lot of experiences and a lot of stories, none of which can be explained with any certainty. And that's what I've tried to do in this story of Ghosts of Martha's Vineyard, talk about different experiences that people have had. And I've really found that I believe what they're telling me. And I hope you do too. So thank you very much for coming on this little walk. And I want to thank Allison of the Oak Bluffs Library and all of the beautiful scenery that we have here at the Oak Grove Cemetery. So thank you for joining us. And if time permits, we'll have questions or comments. Thank you. Wow. Oh man, that was amazing. Well done. Oh my god. How do you do it? How do you memorize all of that stuff? I can't believe I just talked. Oh. I kept thinking you were going to but, you were going point. to say something or stop me or no, no. whatever.